good to be here tonight. You have a Bible tonight? You got it? Everybody got a Bible? You gonna? I don't know that you'll need it tonight, but it's good to have one in the house of God. I've just got just about every one of the verses here up on the screen, and I want to go ahead and get started in this. Numbers do not what? Numbers do not what? Lie. Numbers do not lie. They are an absolute. They are firm, they are pat, they are stable. They, they cannot change, and they're an absolute. And God uses numbers. God, this is, I'm going back several years. I'm going back to something that God showed me several years ago. I, I told my testimony in some of the other videos, but back around 1997, God called me into a ministry studying Bible prophecy. I didn't know what God was going to show me then, but uh, I thank Him for the journey that I've been on since then. And uh, God, first of all, He showed me where the Bible was. And I remember the day when He came into my office. There the Holy Ghost visited me and said, Mike, the King James Bible is the Word of God. It has no mistakes in it. And uh, I do not apologize for that statement. I won't apologize for that statement because uh, I'm not the author of that statement. The Bible is. And, and we'll, uh, we'll have some more teachings on that uh, in another video. But uh, without any evidence whatsoever, the Holy Spirit just spake to my heart and said, This is it. And I surrendered to that and I believed it. And from that point, then God began to supply evidence to me. And I remember the day when God basically said, Mike, let's study numbers. And so I got two sources uh, that I had. That's, uh, that they just were given to me. One of them was E.W. Bullinger's uh, of Scripture Numerics. And the other was by a man by the name of Ed Bellow, who who's now gone on to be with the Lord. But he wrote a book about Bible numbers, and uh, he did a, a wonderful study in the Word of God. And what I'm going to show you tonight is things that I've seen by way of a computer program that I use called QuickVerse 3.0, and, and I'll give anybody a copy of that if they want it. But um, Ed Bello did his study on numbers and the Scriptures without any computer whatsoever. He had a strong concordance, and he just began to count by hand certain things and certain number patterns that were in the King James Bible. So God... God, I had a list there in Ed Velo's book of what every number represented according to Ed Velo, what he saw in the scripture. And I trusted that. I, I felt like he was on the right track. But I remember going to God and I said, God, Ed Velo and E.W. Bullinger, they're men. Okay, they're men. And what I want to know about these numbers, and I believe God led me in this prayer, what I want to know about these numbers, I don't want to come from them. I want it to come from you. And so if this list here that I see in Ed Velo's book is right, then I want you to show it to me from the pages of the King James Bible. And that's what God did. And that's what I'm going to share with you tonight is what God showed me by way of numbers in the Scripture, how you can see them prophetically, but also that there are patterns, numerical patterns, that are in this book. And I'll never forget how God led me to that one day. And before we're all done with this teaching... I'm going to share with you my testimony on how God introduced me to these patterns. It was one of the one of the most. Uh, uh, it, it's been it was incredible the way God did this for me. It, it, it was truly revelation. But I want to share this with you tonight. And so I want you to notice up here on the screen. Take a look here. I've got some verses up here that um, uh, I have a verse and I have numbers along with them. You'll see it up there on the screen. Jeremiah thirty three three. This is one of my favorite verses. Calling me and I will answer thee. And show thee great and mighty things with which thou knowest not. Now I want you to notice what the verse is saying. And also I want you to look at the number that you see associated. You see a pattern of threes there. Ezekiel 33, 33. And when this cometh to pass, lo, it will come. Then shall they know. Notice the word know there that a prophet hath been among them. You see through the Bible a contrast between knowing and not knowing. And God is going to associate it with certain patterns or certain numbers in the scripture. So when this come to path lo, it will come. Uh, then shall they know that a prophet hath been among them. And you see a pattern of threes there. Job 33, 3. My words shall be of the uprightness of my heart. And notice what he says. And my lips shall utter knowledge clearly. That's opposed to unclearly. Or how Moses spoke. The Bible said Moses spoke in broken speech. And Israel didn't understand. Now we see. Now Moses speaks plainly to us in the New Testament. And we understand and that's what Job's talking about there. And you notice the pattern of threes. In Job 33, 33, he said, If not, hearken unto me, hold thy peace, and I shall teach thee what? 
wisdom. We see wisdom and a number up there. Let's look at some more. John 3, 33. He that received his testimony has set to his seal that God is true. Notice receiving a testimony, which is equivalent to receiving the word of God. Deuteronomy 33, 3. Yea, he loved the people. All his saints are in thy hand. And they sat down at thy feet. Everyone shall receive. There it is again. Shall receive of thy words. Notice the, notice the, the context and notice the number there. Jeremiah 32, 33. And they have turned unto me the back and not the face, though I taught them, rising up early and teaching them. Yet they have not hearkened to receive instruction. There it is again. And notice the number 33 up there. Isaiah 33, 6 says, And wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times. Notice it's associated with wisdom. Notice what the verse is saying. He's saying wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times. We're walking in dark days, my friend. Somebody say amen. We're walking in the days prophesied of us uh, in the scriptures. And there are going to be things, there are going to be dreadful things, there are going to be terrible things that are going to happen, I believe, in front of our eyes. And I believe God wants a generation of His people who are stable, who are secure, who are not afraid of what's going on in this world. Why? Because they know that what they see in the world is what God said happens in the Scriptures. Can I hear you say amen? And when He said these things have come to pass, He said, lift up your heads... For your redemption draweth not. I'm ready for the rapture, aren't you? Somebody say amen. Now, Proverbs 3.3, 3, notice the number still there, 33. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee, bind them about thy neck, and write them upon the table of thine heart. Here again, receiving wisdom, receiving uh, the words of God. Psalm 33.11, the counsel of the Lord standeth forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. We're starting to see... A pattern of things like knowledge and understanding and receiving the word associated with the number 33. Look at there, Numbers 33, 3. And they parted from Ramesses in the first month, on the 15th day of the first month. On the morrow after the Passover, the children of Israel went out with an high hand in the what? Look, what's that word there? Sight. Is sight an important word in the Bible? There are two types of people. There are people who can see. There are people who can blind. And I'm talking about spiritual blindness and spiritual sight. How many of you see that? Say amen. And, and when you see Jesus healing blind men, he's given you a picture of what's going to happen to Israel in the last days. They're going to be able to see for the very first time who is under the veil of Moses. They're going to see about Jesus. But notice the word sight and notice the number 333. Because I saw this one day and I knew God put it there that the word sight is used exactly 333 times in the King James Bible. I don't believe that that's there by accident. And I'm going to show you hundreds more examples just like that. I went to the 333rd chapter of the Bible. Everybody turn there. Go ahead. Turn to the 333rd. Some, some of you are not going to do it. I'm going to do it for you. Isaiah 38, verse 3. Notice there at the bottom we have the word sight there in the 333rd chapter of the Bible. Remember that the word sight is used 333 times. 333rd chapter, the word sight. Guess what I found in the 333rd verse of the Bible? No. But what I did find was God told Abraham to lift up his eyes and look. And what I want you to do is I want you to start to count things in the Bible. Start counting things that are easy to count. Count a pattern. Count a cadence in the Bible. Notice what God says here. He says, lift up thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward, southward, eastward, and westward. We have a number here. Now, God could have simply said, uh, Abraham, just lift up your eyes and look everywhere. But that's not what he said. He's actually giving you a cadence, a rhythm. A pattern to follow. And we have how many directions? We have four. When we get to this number, we're going to find out why God wanted Abraham to look in those four directions. And it has to do with the real blessing that God's blessing Abraham with. It has to do with the real country that Abraham has sought for. And yes, I believe in the land of Israel. I believe in that territory that God gave the Israelites I believe that it should belong to them, don't you? I don't believe it belongs to the Palestinian army. I don't believe it belongs to the Vatican. I don't believe that it belongs to the secret societies or anything like that. I don't believe it belongs to the Muslims. I believe that it belongs to God's people. Can somebody say amen? But there is yet a country that they are looking for. And I believe you and I know where that's at, don't you? 
And we're going to associate it with the number four. Look in the book of wisdom, the book of Proverbs. You'll find the word wise mentioned 66 times, which is 33 times two. By the way, how many books are in this Bible? 66. Is this not a book of wisdom? Amen? Notice here, all forms of the word know mentioned 66 times. That means know, knowledge, or knoweth. All forms of the word understand mentioned 66 times. Understand, understanding, understandeth. In the book of Proverbs, notice that their association is with wisdom and the number 33. We have a pattern here of the number 11 and 22 and 33 and 66 repeated numbers like that. You find the word wisdom used in 222 verses of the King James Bible. Truth used 222 verses. The word known is mentioned exactly 222 times in this book right here. Here's some more. Look at Mark chapter 4 verses what? What verse is that? 22. For there is nothing hid which shall not be manifested. The number 22 is the number for revelation. If you look at a book called the book of Revelation, how many chapters are you going to find in that book? There's 22 chapters there. And Revelation's at the end of the Bible. And how many books are in the Bible? 66. That's 22 times 3. I believe God's got everything in order, doesn't He? God uses numbers. He uses patterns. He has a signature. God is a God of order. We're going to see a verse about that. Notice Luke 12, 2. We still have the twos together. 22. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall be known. The book of Revelation, we mentioned that a while ago. 66th book of the Bible has 22 chapters. The number 22 is the number for Revelation. Look at these words here. Brightness is mentioned 22 times. These are all words associated with with, uh, revelation or things revealed or things that are seen. The word discovered 22 times. The word learned 22 times. The word known 222 times. The word taste 22 times. What does that have to do with knowledge and understanding? Can you think of a verse in the Bible that uses the word taste? Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. You discover by tasting. And how many of you have tasted the good things of Christ? Say amen. You found out they were good, weren't you? And when you tasted, God gave you revelation. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And the word mystery. They say, well, Brother Mike, I got you there. The word mystery has to do with things that are hidden, things that are secret. But actually, if you just, if you just, you can do this on your computer. You can uh, go onto the internet and do a search of the King James Bible on several places on the internet. You can get out a Strong's Concordance and you look up every single occurrence of the word mystery in the King James Bible. You know what you're going to find out? Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, we shall all be changed. The Bible, every time it uses the word mystery in the New Testament, And that's the only place where it's found is that it will always tell you that the mystery is revealed now to us who believe that the scriptures are the inspired word of God. Is that you tonight? Say amen. So God's going to unfold mystery for us. And especially here in the last days. Watch this. Now we have a woman in the book of Revelation who has that as her first name. Her name is Mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And you know what I believe about that? I believe that if you study this book, you'll figure out who that woman is. Amen? God will reveal to you who that woman is. Now look at Mark 4.11. Notice that the number of 11 is given here. And the number 11 has to do not with revelation, but it has to do with confusion and disorder. So look at Mark chapter 4, verse 11. And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know, there it is, it is given for you to know the mystery of God, but unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. You see a a, a duality here. He said unto you, because you believe me, because you trust in me, I'm going to give it to you to know the mysteries. But to those who are without, those who do not believe in me, those who do not trust in me, they're not going to know. Hence we see the number 11. Notice here in Genesis chapter 11. What did God do in Genesis chapter 11 associated with confusion? We see here the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. How many of you believe that? Somebody brought to me several years ago. They said, Brother Mike, I'm taking a, I'm going back to night school and I'm taking a course on etymology. That is the study of human language, linguistics. And they said, they, they showed me in their textbook, a, a, a secular college textbook written by evolutionists that said that they can all, all the etymologists, all the linguists, can trace all the languages back to a mother tongue, one language, 
about 5,000 years ago. And when I read that, I said, that corresponds with the Bible because that is about the time that the Tower of Babel took place. Isn't that neat? That even the world has to admit that the Bible's right. Genesis chapter 11, verse 9. Hmm. 11 and 9. Think about it. There is, therefore is the name of, the, of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Notice here when we have 11 disciples, and what are you talking about? I'm talking about when Judas drops off the scene. When Judas has betrayed Christ and now he's dead, we have 11 disciples left. And notice what the Bible says. Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some, what? Doubted. When you have 11, you have confusion. Afterward, he appeared unto the 11 as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. There's the 11 and there's confusion. Luke 24 verses 9 through 11, get it? And they returned from the sepulcher and told all these things unto the 11 and to all the rest. And it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James. And by the way, Mary Magdalene was not the wife of Jesus Christ. Amen? I'll deal with that in another video, all right? And other women that were with them, which told them, we're the, we're the wife. We're the bride of Christ. Amen. And if Jesus married, watch this. If Jesus married Mary Magdalene, and then he's coming back to marry us, you know what that disqualifies him as? It disqualifies him as the bishop of our souls, because the bishop is to be the husband of one wife. Somebody say amen. I believe God's right. Amen. Now watch this. In verse 11, and they come back and told them all these things, and their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. The eleven disciples and confusion. Now, Acts chapter 2. But Peter standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice, and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken. Drunken they picture it's a type of confusion, as ye suppose, seeing is but the third hour of the day. So when you have eleven disciples... There on the day of Pentecost, you have Peter with the eleven, it's mentioned there, and you have that, that divergence of tongues being spoken, and some people are confused, and what Peter was doing, he said, this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel. Because in Isaiah 28, verse 11, the Bible says, with stammering lips and another tongue, will he speak to this people? Do you know what God was doing on the day of Pentecost? He was sending a spirit of confusion to Israel because they refused to believe that Jesus was their Messiah and they had him crucified. Notice even the word tongue is mentioned 33 times, which is 11 times 3 in the New Testament of the King James Bible. Notice Matthew 27. In about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, now we have that interpreted for us. Because of the Bible, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there when they heard that said, this man called for Elias. Isn't that interesting that they at the foot of the cross did not even know what Jesus was saying to them. They misinterpreted it. Why? Because God said with stammering lips and another tongue will I speak to this people. And where was it that Jesus was quoting from? He was quoting from the scriptures, wasn't he? Does anybody know where it was? Psalm 22, the number for revelation. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse what? Look at it. Verse 11. And for this cause, God shall do what? Send them strong delusion. You know what's going to happen here? Very soon. We can already see it at work. Is that God is going to pour out a spirit of strong delusion upon this world. And this world is going to go into confusion and chaos, just like what happened at the Tower of Babel. Look at that. How many of you remember that? 9-11. And I have a teaching on that we're going to do before too long that shows you some of the numerics about what happened on September 11, 2001. Notice they're using that number, that 9 of that 11 for the towers there. There was something that went on that day. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. Look at God's grand design in the New Testament. There are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. That's alphabet in Hebrew. And if you don't know that, and you say, well, how can I know there are 22 letters in Hebrew alphabet? Turn to Psalm 119, and you'll read all 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet in your King James Bible. 
There are 22 books called letters or epistles in the New Testament. God knew what he was doing when he formed the New Testament. The Bible, it's the Bible scholars that don't believe this stuff. Amen. You ought to believe it. Amen. Because it's simplistic. Simple. The Bible scholars don't believe it. Letter or letters mentioned 22 times in the New Testament. And look what they said about Jesus. And the Jews marveled, saying, how knoweth this man what? Letters having never learned. And we see that word associated with revelation in the New Testament. There are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, and there are five final forms. What that is, is, is that the, the Jews have five of those letters that when they, when they appear at the end of a word, they have a different drawing or a different characterization to them. So technically, there are 22 letters plus five, and that means that there are about 27 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Now watch this, okay? The word mystery is mentioned 22 times in the King James Bible. Mysteries is mentioned how many times? Five times. We're starting to see a pattern here, don't we? 22 letters, five final forms. 22 times the word mystery, and then five times the word mystery is found in the Bible. And the Bible says in Romans 11, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happening to Israel. Why is blindness? What does it mean when it says blindness in part has happened to Israel? How many eyes do you have? Everybody say two. That's pretty good. So unless you like me, you got four. Amen? Okay? You got, you got, you've always got six, all right? And you have two eyes, and they help you see three-dimensionally. And the, and the thing is, when the Bible says that blindness in part is, how many parts are through the Bible? We're going to get to the number two here in a little bit. There's Old Testament and New Testament. And when the Bible says that blindness in part, I'm, blindness in full has happened to me. Hang on. Blindness in part has happened to Israel. That means that they're blind in one eye. They only read one testament of the Bible. And they don't understand. But one of these days, they're going to have their eye open, and they're going to read the New Testament, and they're going to believe that Jesus died for their sins. Somebody say amen. But look at the design that's in the New Testament. There are exactly 27 books in the New Testament. Five history books and 22 books that we call letters. Now think about this. Think about this. When you open up your Bible, and you look at this Bible here, okay, and you, you look at the New Testament, you'll see that, and we, and we're, we, how, how is it that we read? We read from left to right. Is, is that right? Did I say that right? Wait, let me see. Okay, yeah, we read from left to right, okay? And um, we look at this Bible, and there are the five history books at the beginning and the 22 letters at the end. But Hebrew is turned around because you would have the 22 letters and then the five final forms. So watch this. God put... The 22 letters of the New Testament last and the five history books first. Why? Because Jews don't read from left to right. How do they read? One of these days, the Jews are going to wake up and see that God authored the New Testament of the Bible and they're going to be saved. I could, I'm going to talk more about that as we move on because I'm telling you, this Bible is not just written for you and I sitting here today or anybody watching this video. I guarantee you that God, I guarantee you that God is going to use this Bible to save Israel in the last days. I promise you He will. That may sound like some fanatical and some people might say, oh, he's a heretic, he can't say that. I can say that on the basis of this book right here that I believe that God's going to save Israel with the Word of God, with the New Testament. Somebody say amen. And anybody that tells you that Israel is going to be saved in the last days by performing sacrifices again, they're a false prophet and they're lying and that lie comes from hell. Because no man can ever sacrifice an animal and pay the price that Christ did on the cross. Amen? God's not going to allow it. Let's look at this number 33 again. Okay? Notice that. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until who come? Shiloh. Who is Shiloh? Shiloh is a name for Jesus Christ. It's a prophecy of Jesus Christ who came from the tribe of Judah. Shiloh, Jesus was 33 years old. Shiloh was mentioned exactly 33 times in the King James Bible. Is that there by accident? No, it's not. And I'm going to show you more here in a minute. David reigned in Hebron seven years, and in Jerusalem he reigned how many years? 33 years over all Israel and Judah. How many years does 33 and 7 make together? Somebody do your adding here. 
33 plus 7 is, come on, you smart people, it's 40. Okay? 33 years and 7 years. Those And both of those are significant numbers in the Bible. Now watch this, okay? Even in the Levitical law, the law for purifying a woman who had a child was that she was unclean for a period of 7 days and then unclean for 33 more days, and that makes 40. We'll talk about that number later. There's Shiloh. Shiloh was a town. It was the first capital of, of the Israelites. It's where the Ark of the Covenant was. I'm going to show you the first and the second coming of Jesus Christ through Shiloh and through Jerusalem. Because you remember that the Ark of the Covenant was brought to Shiloh first, mentioned 33 times, but God destroyed Shiloh because of the wickedness of Israel. Then David, when he came on the scene, he's a picture of the second coming. He brings the Ark of the Covenant, watch this, he brings the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem with trumpets and with shouting. What does that sound like to you? Sounds like the rapture, doesn't it? We just talked about that. That's the second coming of Christ. Now watch this, okay? 33, Shiloh. Shiloh was the first tabernacle. It's a picture of Christ when He comes the second time. Jerusalem, the second tabernacle. Shiloh's mentioned 33 times. It's a picture of Christ when He came the first time and Israel rejected Him. Jerusalem is mentioned 667 times. And when you add them together, you get 700. And that number points you to the kingdom of God. And it actually is the number pointing you to the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Somebody say Amen. Now when Jesus, look at this. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came what? Wise men. They're going to sit. And what were they asking? They were asking, where is he that is born king of the Jews? By the way, I didn't get to this a while ago. When David reigned seven years and then 33 years, watch this. Christ was born king of the Jews, wasn't he? He was born king. Look what it says. Where is he that is born king of the Jews? When he died 33 years later, what did they hang over his head? This is the king of the Jews. So David is, is pointing you to Christ in that he reigns one time for 33 years. And Christ, when he came, reigned as king of the Jews for 33 years. And then David reigned for seven years. Guess what? Christ is going to reign over Israel for how many years and be king of the Jews once again? Seven years. He's going to fulfill the type given in David. Okay? And when the wise men were asking, where is he that is born king of the Jews? They said, well, let's look in the scriptures. And they turned to the book of Micah. Micah is the 33rd book of the Bible. Wise men looking for Christ where he was born. And the 33rd book of the Bible says that he's to be born in Bethlehem. The patterns are there. Notice this. The phrase, the beast. Who's the beast? It's the Antichrist. Last day. I saw a beast rise up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns. He is mentioned exactly 33 times in the King James Bible. Now when I get to the number three, it's going to make more sense why he's mentioned that way. But we're watching things take place in this earth right now that's showing us the rise of the beast in the last days. Notice this in Joshua 12.1. Now these are the kings of the land which the children of Israel smote. It's interesting. I found this one day in the book of Joshua that it actually says that Moses slew two of the kings and Joshua smote 31 of the kings. How many does that make? 33. That's a picture of the beast in the last days. When they went into the promised land, before they could take the promised land, the kings of the promised land had to be defeated and killed. And what Christ was doing at the cross when he died when he was 33 was showing the defeat of his enemies in the last days. Somebody say amen. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 33. For God is not what? The author of confusion. What does an author do? He writes, but how many of you believe God wrote a book? And when they tell you, when they tell you behind those pulpits, when they tell you, now you're reading there in your King James, and uh, now, now what the original Greek really says, you know what they're trying to tell you? They're trying to tell you that you can't believe what you read. 
They're trying to sell you a Bible that is not in order. And if you just want to nail down what I believe, I believe that God is the author of order. I believe that God, they say that, well, mistakes over years have crept into the Bible. Ha uh -uh, wrong. I believe that a God who is so powerful as to keep me saved can keep His Word intact for thousands of years. Don't you believe that? In fact, He's not much of a God if He would send His Word all the way down to this earth and then let men corrupt it and leave us 4,000 years later trying to decide if the Bible said this or not. That's not much of a God. Amen? God is not the author of confusion. Notice that. Where do, you, where do you get this, Brother Mike? Wisdom and knowledge come from counting. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the two witnesses that God showed me to count things in the Scripture. Revelation 13. Here is wisdom. The Bible's trying to tell you where wisdom is. Here's wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man. And his number is what? 600, three score, and six. Now, I'm not going to ask you to turn to the 666th book of the Bible. But I... I actually have a computer program that counts chapters. And I, and I started using it, and I'm going, hey, that's pretty neat. And so when I saw, I thought, man, I'm going to go to the 666th chapter of the Bible, and I thought that I was going to find the name of the beast there. Well, I didn't. But what I found in Ecclesiastes 7 was that Solomon said, I apply my heart to know and to search and to seek out wisdom. Solomon was searching for wisdom. And he found it. Behold, this have I found, saith the preacher, counting one by one to find out the account. So here we have two witnesses, one New Testament, one Old Testament. They're both saying that wisdom comes by counting, and they're both associated with the exact same number. I believe that God put that there. Don't you? Somebody say amen. Let's look at these numbers real quick. The number one, let's keep it simple. If you were to imagine... What the number one meant. You would say beginnings, right? Number, number one is always the first number in anything. And, and by the way, by the way, I asked God, God, show me what these numbers mean. And God said, Mike, you'll find the number meanings in the Genesis chapter. And I went, hmm. Now, when we hear these little voices, the Bible said, test the spirits to see whether they're of God. We're not to jump to conclusions. We're not to run out and say, I've got a vision from God. And it not be true. We're to test the spirits. God doesn't have a problem with that. And so I said, okay, I'm going to prove it. I'm going to see whether or not the list that I see here on this paper matches what I see in the Bible. So I went to Genesis 1. And this one was is real easy. In the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. By the way, do you believe that? Say amen. See, you can be saved if you believe that 6,000 years ago, God created the heaven and the earth. That's when you say, I don't believe that. You better watch out. You know what you're doing? You're calling God a liar. You're saying that science and evolutionists and man are smarter than the Bible. Amen? They're not. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So the number one is the number for beginning. That's what we see in Genesis chapter 1. Notice, notice the number one lays out for us a pattern of things that are first, things that are begun, things that, that are preeminent or should be preeminent in our lives. Isaiah 41, who hath wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, the first and with the last, I am He. Now I want you to notice this. This is for our Jehovah's Witness friends who don't believe that Jesus is God. Do you believe that Jesus is God? Say amen. Look at what the Old Testament says. It says that the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, and that in the Hebrew is God's name, Jehovah, the four letters in Hebrew, Jehovah, that is God's name, and everybody knows that. The Jehovah is first and last. Well, here we have Jesus in Revelation 22. He said, I am Alpha Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Right there. It says in the Old Testament, Jehovah is the first and the last. And then Jesus comes along and says, I am the first and the last. Guess who Jehovah is? It's Jesus. Somebody say Amen. The Bible says that He is the first and the last. Exodus 13, sanctify unto me all the what? Firstborn. Why? Because God always gets His first. Amen? Try, pay the, try paying your tithes last. Try waiting till you pay all your bills and then say whatever's left I'll give to God. 
Don't you dare do that. Amen. Israel tried it for thousands of years. It never worked for them and it won't work for you either. Amen. The Bible says God gets it first. He said the firstborn. Thou shalt not delay to offer the first of the ripe fruits and of thy liquors. The firstborn of thy son shalt thou give unto me. Exodus 23, the first of the first fruits of the land thou shalt bring into the house of the Lord thy God. Now watch this. Matthew chapter 1. And knew her not until she had brought forth her what? Firstborn. Is it important that Jesus was the firstborn son? Is it important? Why? Because God said that one's mine. That's how, he said that's how you're going to recognize who the Messiah is. He's the firstborn. That's the King James. Notice what the NIV says. But he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son. Notice what they've done. They've removed the firstborn out of that. And I'll tell you something. I think the devil's up to something in these new translations. Can I hear you say a loud amen? I think he's up to something. He has corrupted the pure word of God. But seek ye what? First the kingdom of God. Not last. I dare you. I dare you. Put God first in every aspect of your life. Put Him first at work. Put Him first at home. Put Him first in your private life. Put Him first in your churches. I promise you God will bless you with the rest of the things you need. Amen? You give, listen, you give to God and you pay your tithes if it's the last dime you own. See, people say, well, you're just saying that because you're a preacher and you're getting rich off that. You guys know me. You know I ain't getting rich off anything. Amen? I got a bunch of people in my house. I ain't got no money. The truth of it is, you give God first if it's the last dime you have. God says, prove me now herewith. Amen. How many of you know that to be true? Uh, testify for the video. Amen. You know. You've, you, you found it out firsthand. You give to God first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And all these things shall be what? Added unto you. That's a number word in the Bible. God the mathematician. Unity. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. I thought the Lord our God is one God, isn't he? Then why does God say our? Is it, as the UFOologists say... Is it because God really is a space alien? And when God's spaceship landed on earth, he decided to plant man's seed on the earth? You'd be surprised at the number of prominent scientists that believe that we were seeded by space aliens or some kind of space seed. You'd be surprised at that. But, and, and they say that when it says, let us make man in our image, that was one alien talking to all the other aliens on the spaceship. But let's do some counting. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. How many fingers am I holding up here? Three. Why? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't care if you don't believe in a trinity, you're wrong. Look at this verse. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is how many Lord? One. Notice the title of one associated with God's name. I and my Father are what? Now, I want you to remember this verse because it's going to get neat here in a minute. Okay? You're going to like this. I'm, going to, I'm, I'm, a, I'm not a scientist, so I have to explain this stuff real easy. I and my Father are one. I want you to notice the number designation that gave, Jesus gives to He and His Father. Notice this verse here. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. You say, I don't have that verse. You've got the wrong Bible then. Amen? Get you a King James Bible. You'll find the verse there where it belongs in the Bible. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Up here on the screen, I have a molecule. How many of you remember what H2O is? Y'all, see, y'all are chemists, aren't you? Okay? I, rem I remember this from high school. Johnny was a chemist. A chemist he is no more. For what he thought was H2O was H2SO4. H2SO4 is the formula for a sulfuric acid. Get it? Okay, never mind. Let's get back to H2O. If you were to think of one prominent symbol seen throughout all the scriptures, it's the symbol of water. In fact, there is, every scientist will tell you there is no life without what? Water. Water is absolutely essential for all life as we know it. That's why God put water on this planet. And they're out there searching Mars and the moon and Jupiter and Saturn. And they're searching all over looking for water. And guess what? They ain't found it. 
They'll find it right here because God put it there. Water is essential for life. And water is consisted of three. Now, when I use this number three, we're going to look at something that points you to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, watch this. The designation of H2 means that in a water molecule, there are two atoms of hydrogen. And the O represents what? How many of you know? Oxygen, two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. And by the way, they can never be separated, can they? Because if you have hydrogen, you have something that doesn't put out fires. You have something that causes fires. And if you have just oxygen, oxygen, try try to blow on a fire to blow it out. Try to blow on coals to make the coals go out. What happens? You increase the fire level. But when you combine them together, you're fireless. Think about hell and heaven. Amen? That's I just like that. But watch this. The two hydrogen atoms in a water molecule, they represent, watch this, God the Father and God the Son. How do you know this, Brother Mike? If you look on a periodic table of the elements, that chart that you looked at in high school that you never could figure out what it was, if you look at the number one position on that, you'll see that hydrogen is number one. Hydrogen atoms in the water molecule are the Father and Son. Jesus said, I and the Father are, guess what? One. That leaves us with one molecule of oxygen. Now, where do we find oxygen in its natural state on this earth? In the air that we breathe. And isn't it interesting that in Latin, in Greek, in Hebrew, the word for spirit is also the word for Air, breath, inspiration, respiration, Greek, pneumos, where we get pneumonia, pneumatic tools. Okay? So here we have the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, I and the Father are one. And then we have oxygen that provides the breath, the wind, the air, the Holy Spirit. Somebody say amen. Notice that one in the King James is God's name. And the Lord shall be king over the earth, and that day shall there be one Lord in his name. What? One. The Bible says his name, one. Now get this. When Moses was gone into the tabernacle of the congregation to speak with him, then he heard the voice of one. Who did he hear speaking? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, because these three are one. He heard the voice of one speaking unto him from off the mercy seat. The mercy seat was an earthly representation of the throne of God. That's where God sits. Now watch this. Second Kings calls him the Holy One of Israel. Now in Revelation chapter 4, John said, I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and look who's sitting on the throne. One. Isn't that neat? One sat on the throne. Who was sitting on the throne? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. One sat on the throne. Now that's the King James Version. Look at what the NIV says. And there was before me a throne in heaven with some one. That just doesn't sound right, does it? You see, when you read it out of the King James, you see that John knew who was sitting on that throne. He saw one sitting on the throne, didn't he? But now you read it, and you don't know who was sitting on the throne. You know what that tells me? I think that somebody who wants to sit on the throne of God was responsible for corrupting the Word of God. Don't you? Hmm. I'm a stickler for this book. Like I say, one afternoon God said, this is my word. I accepted it. When I see things like this, I'm convinced that this is the word of God. Can I hear you say amen? Let's do with the number two. Can two walk together except they be agreed? How about your husbands and wives? Say amen. Can two walk together except they be agreed? How many legs do you have? Two. Okay. Can they, can they walk together except they be agreed? If one leg wants to go in that direction and one leg wants to go in that direction, you're not going anywhere, are you? Amen? Same with a marriage. Same with a partnership. Same with same with the church. And by the way, we're going to see this when we deal with this number. How many divisions do we have in this book? Two. Old Testament, New Testament. Does the Old Testament agree with the New Testament? Does the New Testament agree with the Old Testament? 
Are there ever any contradictions anywhere in the Bible? The Bible says none shall want for her mate. And when God said, can two walk together except they be agreed, he meant exactly that, that if the Old Testament disagreed with the New Testament one time, then it's not the Word of God, is it? They don't agree, and they can't walk together. Somebody say amen. Be ye not unequally yoked together. There it is, Paul teaching at the New Testament, isn't he? You're going to find a mate? Make sure that they believe what you believe. Because two cannot walk together except they be agreed. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Well, notice, notice the cadence here. Righteousness and unrighteousness. Light and darkness. Christ and Belial. Notice he's only given two here. He's not given three. He's given two. Okay? Temple of God with idols. For you are the temple of, of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore shall a man leave his father. The number two is the number for unity. And we look in the second chapter of the Bible and that's what we see. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his... Not, not, his, not his husband. Amen. He didn't say a man and a man. He said a man and a woman. A husband shall cleave unto... He didn't say cleave unto his wife. Amen. Run wife. They should and kill it, cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Now these guys that don't believe the Trinity, when Jesus said, "I and the Father are one," they say, "Well, that's not literal. You know, they can't be literal. You can't see that in literal interpretation." They, and they say because you know, back when Adam and Eve, when the Bible says they two clave together and they shall be one flesh, they weren't really one flesh. They were still two people. Did you know that the Bible's right and man's wrong? Amen. I mean, just stop thinking about this for a minute. A husband and a wife coming together. What happens nine months later? The two became one flesh, didn't it? Isn't it sweet? How many of you believe this Bible's right and man's an idiot? Amen? The, the, people, who, the people who we put in charge of trying to discern this Bible have, have, have abandoned the principles, the, the simple principles of the Scriptures is that the Bible is always right and man is wrong when he contradicts the Word of God. Amen? Even science. When science contradicts the Word of God, science is wrong. It's not the Word of God that's wrong. The Bible scholars and the pulpits of America are full. I'm getting calls from all over the country. Brother Mike, we cannot find a church that still preaches out of King James. You know why? Because the pulpits of this country have, have, have bought into the idea that man is smarter than the Bible. And that it's up to the preachers and the Bible scholars to correct what has been poorly translated in their opinion. And you know where that's leading? That's leading to doctrines of devils being floated into the church. You believe that, say amen. This is what we stand for in this church. This is what we believe. Because God's right. And we're only right when we agree with God. The number for witness, at the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death. This is the third time I'm coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Number for witness. And I will give power unto my how many witnesses? Two witnesses and they shall prophesy. These two witnesses, I don't know who they are. Everybody's got a theory, that's fine. I don't know who they are. I guess we'll find out one of these days. But I'm telling you, when they come on the scene, well, I believe they represent the Old Testament and the New Testament. They represent the first second coming of Christ. They represent everything that the number two represents. And I promise you that when one of them preaches, the other one's amen. And when this one preaches, that guy's amen. And I'll tell you, so I'll tell you what works for a church is when a pastor, when he preaches, the congregation, amen. You know why? Because the two walk together and they agree. Amen. And from Jesus Christ, who is the what? Faithful witness. I like this. Why is the Bible called him a witness? I thought you needed two witnesses. Well, he came the first time, didn't he? And he testified. He's coming again. That makes two, doesn't it? He's the faithful witness. And Moses turned and went from the mountain. And how many tables of the testimony were in his hand? Two. You know what, Moses? Typology. I'm going to get to a lesson on typology. It just is one of my favorite subjects aside from numbers. And here is Moses in, in picture form coming down from heaven with the Old and the New Testament of the Bible in his hand. Isn't that neat? The two walked together and they agreed. And by the way, how many times did he come down from the mountain? Twice. The first time, watch this, it's a picture of the first and second coming of Jesus Christ. The first time He comes down 
Oh, get this. The first time he comes down, he's got the law. Jesus came in the form of the law to Israel. And Israel broke the law. Jesus was, he said, this is my body, which is what? Broken for you. Moses broke the tables. That was Jesus being broken on the cross. And Israel rejected. Then Moses goes back up. And I have a, I have a wonderful teaching on this. We'll get to a long time from now. It's about the rapture. And you see the rapture in Moses coming down from the mountain the second time. I'll show it to you. It's one of the neatest things I've ever seen in my life. But here's Moses coming down the second time. This time his face shines how? Shining bright like the sun. Remember the Mount of Transfiguration, Matthew 17. Jesus' face shone how? As the sun. Revelation chapter 10. A mighty angel coming down. His face shines how? That's the Son. I believe that's Jesus. He comes down. He comes. He's clothed in the clouds. Behold, He shall come in the clouds. Everything in Revelation 10 points to Jesus. Here's Moses coming down. Coming down the second time. This time, He's got the two tables in His hand with Ten Commandments on them. And this time, Israel looks at Him and says, everything that God said, we'll believe now. You know what I believe? I believe when Jesus comes down from the clouds the second time, I believe that Israel is going to believe every word in this book. Can I hear you say amen? Isn't that beautiful? For God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not. God has spoken once, twice have I heard this. We're going to see that God speaks once, God speaks twice. And for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh how many times? Twice. It's because the thing is established of God. God never speaks once. But he speaks twice. So if you believe that God spoke in the Old Testament, then you believe that God spoke in the New Testament and vice versa. God has spoken once, twice have I heard this. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth, first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. What are you getting at, brother Mike? What I'm telling you is when God created the first heaven and the first earth, how did he do it? He spoke it. God speaks once and then what happens? He speaks Twice. And watch this. The Old Testament was good. The New Testament is better, isn't it? And which comes first? The old or the new? The old and then the new. Isn't that how God did it with you? You were born once and God said that it was good. How many of you have been born twice? Isn't it better? Amen! Isn't it better? God speaks once. Yea, twice. The new heaven and new earth are going to be far better than the first heaven and the first earth. Somebody say Amen. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. Let me tell you something that I know and believe as a Christian about death. Death is a necessary part of what God wants to do in us. Amen? Death has to happen. What's baptism all about? Dying to the old self, being raised to new. Notice what he says here, he taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. We are not going to get our new bodies saved from the rapture. We're not going to get our new bodies until this old body is done away with. Amen? And I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm 41 years old. I'm getting to where I'm starting to not like this body anymore. I don't think my days as a professional sports athlete, I don't think they're ever going to happen, Bradley. Okay? I just don't see it in the, in the works here, especially after being electrocuted. All right? I just don't see it happening. You know what I'm looking forward to? Second body. Second life. New heavens, new earth. Mm -mm -mm. Notice this. And he said, Blessed be thou the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast showed more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning. That's, that's because God did that. Notice this. Though thy beginning was small, yet thy latter end should greatly increase. Notice what it says about Job. Your beginning, your beginning was, was small, the latter end should greatly increase. The Lord, so the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. God's setting a pattern here. Is that what happens last is better than what happens first? Somebody say amen. How many of you believe that? Say amen. I believe the days ahead of us are better than the days behind us. I have that hope. Amen. Now watch this. Watch this. 
the glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former. He was talking about the temple of God. Not Herod's temple, not the second temple, but the temple of God that Jesus Himself brings down to this earth. That's going to be better than any house built by man. Somebody say Amen. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and then when men have well drunken, then that which is worse. Notice, watch this, notice that when man does it, man always starts out with the good stuff and then ends with the bad stuff. When God does it, he always starts out with something that's okay, but he ends up with something that's Tremendous. Great. Amen. Do you see that? Now watch this. Here's where I'm going with this. Bible scholars all over the place will tell you, and they sound real sanctimonious about it. They sound real spiritual about it. They say, we believe the Bible was inspired in the original manuscripts. But over time, corruption has crept in to copies and we don't have something as inspired and perfect as the original. How dare you King James people say that your Bible's inspired? We know that it can't be because we know that it corrupted. You know what they're saying? They're saying that God started out the Bible in this earth and it was perfect. And it's gone downhill ever since. Does that sound like God to you? It doesn't, does it? That's not God's handiwork. Watch this. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. The Bible that they're trying to hand you that started out perfect and is now corrupt, that's a sign of the judgment of Almighty God. I like it the other way, don't you? This, this number two, and we're almost done with this part, the future of Israel. So the last shall be first and the first shall be last, for many shall be called and few chosen. Just very quickly, you can see the nation of Israel. And you can see the church and all these, in, the, in these two number types, I call them in the Bible. Okay, You see Ishmael and Isaac. Who really was the first to come out of Abraham's body? It was Ishmael. This Isaac was the, was the child of promise. Did you know that Paul said that Ishmael is a picture of Israel, the Jew? And that, and that Isaac is a picture of the Gentile church. And one of these days, it's going to be Ishmael, representing Israel, is going to take their rightful place. Jacob and Esau, who was the firstborn out of Isaac? It was Esau, wasn't it? Then it was Jacob. They both go to their father. Jacob gets the first blessing, but Jacob was born second. Esau gets the latter blessing, but he was born first. Notice how they're switched around. He that was first is last, and he that is last shall be first. And God called Israel first, but they rejected. That's who Esau represents. And then God gave salvation to us. But one of these days, when it's taken off Jacob, it's going to be given back to Esau. Look at Zerah and Perez. Zerah and Perez were the twin sons of Judah. And Zerah actually broke through the matrix first. And what did they tie on to him to prove that he was the firstborn? A scarlet thread. You see that scarlet thread all throughout the Scriptures. That represents the promise of the hope of the blood of Jesus Christ on them. Zerah represents the, is the nation of Israel. Perez, his name being, means breach, which means he busted through after Zerah, and he was counted the firstborn, and that is where the lineage of Christ, who came the first time, was from. Rachel and Leah. Who was the first love of, uh, of Jacob? It was Rachel. She represents Israel. Leah, we're the ugly sister. Amen. Praise God. We're the ugly sister. We were, we, we were chosen first. But we go first into the bridegroom's chamber. Somebody say amen. You see the types there. Manasseh and Ephraim. Jacob brings his sons, or Joseph brings his sons to Jacob, his father to be blessed. Manasseh on, on Jacob's right hand. Ephraim on Jacob's left hand. Manasseh represents Israel. Ephraim represents the church, the second born. Jacob takes his hands and crosses them. Lays his hand of blessing upon them. And Chris crosses the blessing. They both get the hand blessing, by the way. And I'll teach you about that later. But we get ours first and then Israel. And don't ever, ever forget that. 